everyone, this is Remlays from 40k Theories, and welcome to this new episode of Adeptus Podcasters. And yes, it has been a while, I finally got a brand new machine, and it works a treat. Hallelujah. Anyway, joining me as always is Tactica Imperialis. Hello everyone, sorry for having to hold the fort down for a month whilst you had to listen to just me talking, so glad to have you back, Remlays. Yeah, do you know what the funny thing is? I still haven't got the old laptop back yet. <laughs> it's, it's still away. Oh God. Um, though, though I did hear yesterday, they have fixed it. They just got to wait, wait for it to come back from the repair centre now. I was like, hallelujah, they've actually finally done something about it. <laughs> small mercies, eh? Ah, small mercies, silver linings and, and sod's law. Like, oh, I just fork out over a grand on a new machine and oh, buy all your machines fixed. <laughs> yeah, every <laughs> like, time. Every time. Every time. Uh, but yes... Let's just jump straight into the news this week, and with the Adepticon reveals. Yeah, there's. Uh, we normally would do a big, long, rambly catch-up with Remley's having been away, but we haven't got the time. There's a butt-ton of stuff to get through, uh, because Adepticon took place on Wednesday uh, night, Thursday morning, I think, and that means there's a butt-ton to cover. I'm, I'm genuinely just going to dive straight in. Where do you want to start? Because I know where I want to start. Well, where do you want to start? I want to start with AOS 4, please. Uh, go on then. Yeah, isn't that teasing Stormcast versus Skaven? Uh, teasing. <laughs> Outright confirming. So, but, um, you know I mean. <laughs> Sigmar hit the, the hell I can't button again. So uh, you might Another remember new the chamber of Stormcast. Yes, so you might remember there was an old joke in AOS two of you can't just open a new chamber. The hell I can't smash button, and that's where we got the sacrosanct, which is the magic ones. Uh, he's done it again with this new edition, and this time he's opened the ruination chamber. Now the ruination chamber are the old guard, I, the Stormcast who have been reforged so many times. They are actually, you know, gone, like. Their humanity's pretty much gone, but they're the only ones that can stand up to corruption of this magnitude, because as Remley says, it's Skaven. Now, this is not something that wasn't known. It was pretty much guaranteed. A lot of people have been saying it. Um, I remember when we had Sotek on the show, they were talking about it. The leaks and the rumour mill has been Skaven, Skaven, Skaven for ages. And then, obviously, they were not made a big faction in Old World, suggesting, oh, they're getting something else. And they have. Uh, but there's actually more going on than just, oh, they're a Skaven now. So, here's what's going on. At the end of Dawnbringers, we got the confirmation of Dawnbringers Book 6. We'll talk about the model that comes with that. It looks as though the grand scheme is thus. In the background of everything that's been going on, Archaon struck a deal with the Great Horned Rat, who, if you recall, at the start of Age of Sigmar, he wanted nothing to do with, to the point that he didn't even let him put a head on Dorgar's mount. So now... The Great Horned Rat is actually a proper Chaos God. Wasn't he already? Mm, technically, no. Like, yes, but no, but. Is it? What I, I thought he ascended. I thought he ascended um, when Slash you know, got dragged in the gap between realms, and then the Horned Rat became the Great Horned Rat, and that's what became sent to the main pantheon, essentially. So when Slanesh got yoinked, it left a space on the pantheon, but the other three were having none of it. And basically just kept the Horned Rat in its place. Right. As I understand it. Basically, it was like, the Great Horned Rat was like, new space? Maybe I could... No. But, 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 but Slanesh is... No. Mm -hmm. And the other three, and Archeon, to be fair, were like, fuck off. No. <laughs> but the Great Horned Rat has somehow managed to do a deal with Archeon to accept his patronage, I'm guessing. I don't know. And now he is a full fledged chaos god like we're not saying that he wasn't a minor such powerful chaos god in the past but now he's on the level of the other four right and what this has done is actually a third of the great parch so you know the realm of fire where um aos one took place yeah so that all took place that campaign on a place called the great parch that area a third of that has now been replaced if you've not watched the trailer go watch it but what happened is um, Blight City, which is a pocket dimension where the Skaven have been living for the past three editions, has now exploded into reality and taken up a third of the Great Parch, which is a titanic amount of space, if you're not aware. Fair enough. So, yes, this is called the Vermin Doom, uh, is the name of the scheme, and uh, 
the Skaven are very much a thing. Now, we got a load of bunch of new stuff in the trailer. We've got rattling guns on wheels. We've got new Jezails. We've got rat ogres, claw lords on rats. Um, obviously, a bunch of Stormcast stuff too, including new heroes, new Terminator. Like, I think these are going to be your analogous to Stormcast Terminators and the like. There's loads of new models in that trailer. We could go on for literally ages. But I think what's more important, because we'll see all this down the line, is what this has done to the rules. They have decided to index... Excuse me, I'm having notifications bing up on my face. Go away, go away, go away. Go away, <laughs> Battle.net. I'm not interested. I don't want you to make changes to my device, Battle.net. Go away. Thank you. <laughs> so, they have rebuilt the game from the ground up. This is a, maybe not an 8th edition level rewrite, but definitely a 10th edition level rewrite, where everyone's going to be indexed. Right. So... They have taken the time to streamline a lot. So Universal Special Rules are a thing in Age of Sigma for the first time, which is huge, because the amount of space taken up on War Scroll cards by every time you use a melee attack with this unit's weapon, you may re-roll a hit roll of one. Just make it a keyword. Just make it a keyword. Yeah. So they are doing Universal Special Rules. I did watch the live stream because I just happened to be up because I'm sad. Um... So I did watch the stream and they talked about the main thing now is about streamlining um, without removing the complexity, but it's about streamlining and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, lots of stuff interested there. There's going to be a more reactive system. Double turn has been reworked. Thank God. They haven't said exactly what they're going to do, but it's now classified as, and I'm quoting the article now, a knife edge decision with a clever twist to scoring, implying that if you do double turn, you may have a penalty in terms of the victory points you can score, which would be a really nice way to capitalize on the fact that you're getting two attacks in a row. So I always remember double turn being a powerful mechanic to the point it was broken, I think, if you didn't know how to handle it. Now I think they're hopefully going to refine it a bit, which will be really good. Fair enough. Uh, they've also done Combat Patrol, but it's called Spearhead. So all the Combat Patrol equivalent boxes for Age of Sigmar, they're called Spearhead boxes. They're going to be a new way to play. Um, so, for example, if you're playing Daughters of Cain, there's an Iron Scale, 5 Melisai, 5 do 5 Warlocks, and 10 Witch Elves. Just to give you a sense of the scale of battle that you're working with here. I also, I actually prefer the name Spearhead to Combat Patrol. Yeah. I think that just... It's a much better name, personally. Yeah, they say they can do it in an hour or less. Oh, nice. Uh, which would be really good. I think it might be something, because we didn't look into Combat Patrol at Warhammer Club because we had just a mix of marine models and we didn't really want to go buy Leviathan or we hadn't really bought Combat Patrol boxes. But I know I have enough Ideneth to make a com to make a spearhead. I We have the Blades of Corn spearhead at Warhammer Club. I know we have a Nurgle player who can do it. I know we can make the Cruel Boys. I know we can make the Stormcast. I've just sold my Slanesh, so I can't do that. And I've just sold my Lumineth, so I can't do that. But I might actually give Spearhead a proper look-see this time round, just to see if it actually is quick. Because if it's quick and pick up and play, this is how I'm going to teach Sigma to Warhammer Club, because we don't play it. We play exclusively 40k. Right. Uh, that's it for now in terms of AOS 4, because obviously the miniatures have not been revealed. Obviously, you can go watch the trailer and make all kinds of predictions as to what the actual models will be. But I'm very much looking forward to seeing what's coming next. And, you know, as an AOS stan, and as I have been an AOS stan, I'm proud of it. I think this is a really good place to take AOS and it belies the Order Civil War problem because I really expected this to be Order Civil War. If it wasn't Skaven, that's where I was going, was Marathi, Malarian, Order Civil War. But Skaven's a really good direction to go to, so bring it on. Mm. Moving to 40k now, um, brand new Chaos Space Marines. Yes. Well, Chaos Space Marine characters, rather. Yep, so we've got two new Chaos Lords. Um, obviously, there's a very modular Chaos Lord in Terminator armor kit, but there isn't actually a modular Chaos Lord on foot. You've got to buy the one with a hammer from Blackstone Fortress, I think is the only Chaos Lord on foot model in plastic, if my memory serves me. Will this be corrected there? Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Um, though I have seen some people complaining in regards to these brand new models, and that... They're both available exclusively initially as part of Battle Forces, but there's a different character in each Battle Force, so you can't get them at the same time. You have to buy both Battle Forces if you want both characters. The caveat there is you've got to buy both Battle Forces if you want both characters right out of the gate. 
Yeah, that's what I mean. I think I, I, I get where people are coming from. If these were both limited run exclusives, I think that would be a completely legitimate complaint. But I don't think it's that bad to tell you the truth, if they're in separate boxes, because it allows players to you know, make a bit of a themed box. It sucks a little bit, and I'd rather means it be available separately. I agree. But it's not the end of the world if you just... Because these aren't characters that aren't hard to kit back. Like, I'm sure people have Chaos Lords, and if you're a new Chaos Marines player, you don't have to buy this Chaos Lord to make a Chaos Lord. You can just use an Aspiring Champion, give them some fancy weapons, and you'll probably be fine. True. But, so yes. I am curious as to whether the... Um... The jump pack version with the lightning claws. I'm curious as if that's actually going to be tabletop legal. <laughs> um, um, well, I mean, if they because remember, because remember when the um, the Eldari Codex released uh, last edition, the Altar depicted on the cover wasn't a legal build. <laughs> so I wonder if it's going to be an issue like this. Like, oh, here's the model, still not legal though. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'm, I mean, given the fact they're not just you know making it known that it's a thing, they're drawing attention to this is the Night Lord's build of twin lightning claws. And it says, it does say, Night Lord has been glad to know the pair of lightning claws is also returning. So it makes it good, quite clear. <laughs> um, which was good for me because I did a little commission for a student as a thanks for all your help with Warhammer Club. And I bought the old resin Chaos Lord with Jump Pack, which has been currently sat as Legends and not legal for the past edition. Um, so it'll be good to get that mm. back in. Um, there are eight detachments because this is all part of the Chaos Space Marine Codex. And if you want to buy the boxes and get the Lords early, these are your options. If you want the Lord on foot, the box comes with 10 Marines, 10 Terminators, 5 Possessed, and 5 Chosen, which is a really good solid infantry core. Like if you're starting a Chaos Marine army, that's a great place to go. Mm. The Lord on Jump Pack is a much more specialised and weird build, because it comes with 10 Cultists, the mutated cultists, sorry, accursed ones, a dark commune, so you've got a proper solid cultist core, then backed up with 10 raptor stroke walk talents, a demon prince, and the lord. So, honestly, I don't like that box in terms of its composition. I think they could have done something a bit cleverer with it. Like, I get cultists, you want a cultist core and then a strike force, but why is there a demon prince there? That kind of undermines the chaos lord a bit by putting the demon prince there. We got excess stock. We need to sell them. <laughs> well, yeah, it's probably that. <laughs> it's probably that. Uh, like, do you remember um, when they did those loot boxes um, a few years ago? Oh God, yeah. Like, here's your space marine loot box, and it's like, right, here's a dark angels Polaris and some space wolf wolves. <laughs> yeah, it's like, wow. Yes, I, I do. Really... I remember. I remember that was horrific. That really did just reek of excess stock they couldn't sell. Yes, absolutely. So no, I think that's fair enough. Um, We'll come back to 40k later because I need to talk about the Tau Codex because that's um, in people's hands now with the Croup box set I think came out this weekend. The uh, £135 box set. I know. I know. It was horrendous. But obviously people have got their hands on that box because they had to go paint it so people put the Codex rules out there and I have one particular thing I need to gripe about and we'll come back to it, okay? Is, is it about the three characters who are now missing from the Codex? No, it's about the battle suits. Right, okay. But we'll come back to it. Uh, right, staying with 40k though, Kill Team has got a new box game, and actually they've really made an effort here. It's Squat Hernkin Pioneers. Um, well, not the Pioneers, they're the bikers, but the equivalent to the foot-mounted equivalent of the bikers. They're called Hernkin Jaegers, who are frontiersmen scouts for Squats, who for some reason wear great coats over their armour. And they will be taking on Gene Steeler Colt's Brood Brothers. So formal models for Gene Steeler Colt Guardsmen, which is really, really good. I think just basically just the Guardsmen kits with an upgrade for Brood Brothers, essentially. I mean, if it is an upgrade, Sprue, then they've really made an effort to put a lot of things. Like you've got different weapons, like you've got shock malls, there's a new Voxcaster equivalent with a loudspeaker, Icon Bearer different heads, the medic stuff's different to the standard. I mean, it looks a bit like the one from the Traitor Guard kit, but not exactly. S snipers, shotguns. I don't think this is just the Guardsman sprue with a Gene Steeler Cult upgrade kit, but I'm willing to be corrected. And even if they are, you can still take um, Magus, Primus, and Patriarchs in this army in Kill Team. You can have Broodlords in Kill Team even if they're not in the mm. box, although I'm assuming they are. 
if they are, they're the exactly the same models as the ones from Death Watch Ignition back in like. Oh yeah, edition. I think I think that was always going to be the case. Like, but yeah, it's still it's still good stuff. And I awesome. think the sorry, I was going to say, can we uh, appreciate the fact we got the Iron Kin wearing the trench coat? Uh, he is adorable. I yes. love him. As we've heard, they've done and um, the the Hankin Jaeger models. I know mean, we just talked about the Brew Brothers. The actual Jaeger models are really, really good. Like, I really like these. Yeah, I I know great coat over armor makes no sense, but the actual design of them is fantastic. The intricate shotguns. There's a medic, um, a massive, massive grenade, crossbows, axes, snipers. Like, mm. this is a really diverse squad. So, yeah, very happy about that. Great stuff. So I'm getting some vibes mixed in between, like, Old West frontiersmen mixed with pirates. I'm also getting, a, I don't know, some of the hats that make me think, like, Soviet as well, like Russian soldiers. Possibly. I, yeah. I, I, just because it's like... I, I see with Deer Stalker hat and all that, yeah. And yeah, the, and, the, the and the great coats and things like that. I don't know. It is a real nice blend. And when Arsenic was here last episode, we talked about, like, the blending of different styles of how they actually make different models call on different heritages really, really well. And this is just another great example, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, great box. I mean, I'm still not going to play it because I ain't got the time to pick up another system and play Kill Team, but great stuff nonetheless. There are some good stuff in here. Like, I, I like that Brew Brother Commander with, like, the regular Gene Stealer hand. Yeah, that's nice. I mean, that's sort of, like, going down the... Ah, oh, wait a minute. That'll be a third generation hybrid, won't it? Sorry, I, I do know my gene stealer cult lore, but I've forgotten which generation. I know fourth gen are entirely human. Well, indis- all but indistinguishable from human. All but, yeah. But these are, I think these are third gen primarily because you can tell from their faces that they're not just... Yeah, that'll, that'll be... With, with two arms, that'll be a third generation. Yeah, because yeah. second generation, they still have three arms, don't they? For the most part, yeah. Yeah, the acolyte hybrids and then the neophyte hybrids have got two arms. Yeah, right, I'm with you. Right, where are we going next? How about to Horus Heresy? Uh, They're doing Mechanicum. Next. And the White Scar? Oh, that's not Depticon. Oh, is it not? Oh, no, it's Heresy Thursday. My mistake. Yeah, so Adhibu Khan is a thing, uh, but that was Heresy Thursday rather than Adepticon. We'll come back to that one. Um, We'll come back to that one. Let's do (laughs) the other battle box then, which is for uh, Warcry. Which has got a Ossiark and Sylvaneth box game pitting like penitent Ossiark, including a Centaurian commander, uh, which is really cool, uh, against a bunch of Sylvaneth who are infected and hoping to try and get healed by a Lariel, but they're almost like lepers, I guess, ah. because the they're like they're sane ish. But they're also like infested with arcane parasites, and because of that, they're trying to get healed by Alariel. But also, the other Sylvaneth are like, if this gets out and the infection gets out, then suddenly this is a disaster because it could infect more Sylvaneth. So they're like lepers almost, trying to get to their god to cure them, but also not being allowed anywhere near anybody. I love the one who's got like armed with two beehives and it's just got us covered with a swarm of bees yeah so that's a swarm sage and actually those bees are not just there they're there to eat the parasites to try and stave off the infection ah but yeah they've got some really cool like corrupted sylvaneth models and i think if you wanted to do like corrupted sylvaneth or chaosy sylvaneth these would be a great place to start because the dryads and the hunters just look slightly more evil than usual which is really good mm. i mean the osiarch stuff's good too you've got little bone hounds which is really cool little vampiric uh shinsus say what shinsus like shih tzu but shin oh Shinsu. my god that... shinsu you're lucky i can't head desk <laughs> <laughs> uh, the leader is actually um a liege cavalry so you know the osiarch heroes um the cavalry hero yeah if you fuck up as one of them then Nagash will fuse you to your horse and make you a centaur. That's the punishment. It's destined to become a Catacross cosplayer. Not Catacross, um, who's the earthquake guy? Kragnos. Kragnos, that's it. Yeah, Kragnos cosplayer. There we go. Yeah. We've also got a couple of different Mortec like, beast masters as well. I think this is a really cool box of Ossiarch. So, yeah, I love this box. And also, um, they made the Dune Worm 
as a piece of terrain, which is called a ravening gnarl oak. It's literally a walking tree that eats things. That has a platform on it for standing on. And has a platform on it for standing on, yeah. So uh, if you want to <laughs> create your favourite great bit of cartoon references, there you go. Hey. <laughs> so yes. We've also got the um, Wintermore thing for um, Warcry. No, Underworld, sorry. Yeah, Underworld. Um, they actually made two dudes in a trench coat. Yes, <laughs> and I love them. He's great. <laughs> so what we've got here is the Brotherhood of the Bolt. Uh, I think it's their name. No, Brethren of the Bolt. So these are fanatics. Oh, um, as you might have guessed, um, who are obsessed with lightning because all of them in their life have been hit by lightning, whether by backwash off a storm cast or whatever. They've all been struck by lightning. And their idea is they can shock through each other to shock and create like taser shots. So they start the game inspired and they lose their inspiration when they electrocute where their taser goes, which can be passed through other people. But if you electrocute someone else with your allies and they can re-inspire each other which is a really interesting mechanic i guess although i'm not an expert hmm. um but it's worth noting that uh yes two dudes in a trench coat this isn't just two random dudes in a trench coat peter Phileas, who's the guy on top is literally stood on the shoulders of his son so the the face you can see is the son of the guy on top right flagellants flagellants <laughs> enough said I said fanatics a minute ago. I should have said flagellants. Sorry. For a minute, I thought you said flatulence. So I was like, what? No, <laughs> That would be a horrible thing to do. But no. A they're... guy having someone flatulence sitting on top of you. Like, ah. Yeah. I, to be fair, <laughs> even normal flagellants completely ignore them. Like, and stay away from them. That's how bad they are. Because you're so crazy. Even the crazies think you're crazy. Indeed. And if you want to fight them, then up against them, you have the Skinnerkin, who are chefs banqueteers for the flesh eater courts who do not regenerate if they die so unlike most undead who come back and they die they don't which makes them a bit harder to manage for undead players but they are able to carve up corpses and try and preserve the fresh cuts they're not here to eat you they're here to cut you up and serve you up to usharan ah. but yes i like the winged one though he looks cool uh yeah i believe that's the leader gristler tenderhook uh, but I'm not entirely sure. I'm assuming she's the leader, just looking at the other ghouls. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, I thought Grizzly Tender Hook would be the one with the hook for the hand. I mean... And the hooks hanging yeah, from the back. That would make sense too, actually. Yeah, that would make sense too. Yeah, I think you're right. And also, uh, River Adepticon, uh, dwarves. Yeah, old world, dwarves. old world dwarves. Uh, they're actually doing quite a lot for the dwarves uh, for their arcane journal on the mountain hold. So we've got new king, new warriors, new quarrelers, new thunderers, and the return of iron drakes, hammerers, iron breakers, gyrocopters, gyrobombers, all that good stuff. Oh, I think they're new warriors. They might not be, but they seem to imply new warriors, but I don't know. Mm. Is it wrong me that when I saw the model of this new dwarf king on his sh- with his shield bearers, I immediately thought, ah, brand new custodian shield general. <laughs> I mean, we, you heard the conversation about the shield captain the other day, didn't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Actually, no, it's not new warriors. Sorry, none of those models are new. The new models are the king on shield bearers. Uh, you've got a k- thane with handgun, uh, a king on foot, um... Ungrim Iron Fist is also back. A young Ungrim Iron Fist. Indeed. Um, and returning in plastic is Iron Breakers, Hammerers, Warriors, Miners, Quarrelers and Thunderers. So lots there. And then in resin returning, you've got uh, the Command set, which has a Lord, a Battlestander Bearer and a Slayer. There are also, I think, some new Slayers shown in the trailer that they don't really talk about here. I feel like they have done new Slayers as part of this, but someone more experienced with Dwarves than me can watch the video to double check. Um, Oh no, sorry, they're not old. They are old Slayers. Sorry, they're the metal ones. Um, So the Grudge Thrower's back, the Bolt Thrower's back, the Flame Cannon's back. Uh, The classic Slayers are back, uh, including the Doom Seekers, the Goblin Hewer, uh, Yosef Bugman's Cart is back, and the Anvil of Doom is back. I remember that Anvil of Doom from like Sixth Edition Fantasy. Um, that's like that's a, that's going on in a few years. Yeah, there's also <laughs> a made to order of Prince Ulther and the Dragon Company, um, and there's a bunch of other stuff that will be 
and they can't even show them here. Like they're that old models. I don't think they have a good picture of them because they haven't got any in stock to show you. Uh, it is the. I think it's worth pointing out that um, Prince Alpha and the Dragon Company, their stuff from like the mid nineteen eighties. They oh, are Christ. old models. They are Christ. old. And, and speaking of old, I'm sure you all know, but if you don't already, um, happy thirtieth birthday to the Warp Spider Kit. Ah, uh, you've been waiting to say that for weeks, haven't you? I have been waiting for that for weeks. It, it turned thirty this month, in fact. Indeed. Um, actually, I want to get your opinion on something, which is the Necromunda trailer. What is going on? I've not actually had a chance to see this one. Um, it's just a teaser. Let me just have a quick look. Yeah, give me a sec. I'll send you the link. It might be quicker. I've, I've got it on the screen, so let me just take a quick yeah, look. Yeah, because there's a bunch of silhouettes on there, but I am nowhere near versed enough in Necromunda lore to actually know what is going on. Right. I assume this has got something to tie into the um, the Enranthian... Um, I think this is the follow-up to the Succession, because it talks about in the article. Yeah, that's it, Enranthian Succession, yeah. yeah. Um, because everyone's been watching that battle between Credo and Hera Helmor. Apparently a far more malign presence has began to make its first moves, and the trailer's title is Delve into Necromunda's Darker Side. Hmm. Uh, well, one of the characters has clearly got a Vansar weapon um there's clearly some vansar mixed in in the te- in the silhouettes teasers if i had to guess i would say it's got something to do with the vansar stc because oh, hang Vans- on a minute. vansar stc is, is a- hang on it says it's a good thing we don't know of any large ruined hives shrouded in superstitious rumor and unexplainable disappearances oh my god it's a skull cluster english please uh, the Skull Cluster was a trio of hives that are basically in ruined uh, on Necromunda for as long as anyone can remember. And they also are sort of like strange lights and strange sounds, screams, what sounds like drums coming up from the depths and stuff like that as well. Um, the main um, rumour regarding them is that they're infested with orcs. These ain't orcs. No, well, we don't know, do we? <laughs> they could be. They but ain't orcs. Necromunda has everything. Necromunda has everything on that. Okay, well, these minis in shadow ain't orcs. No, again, these look like Vansar, if I had to guess. Judging from the shape of the weapons, they look like Vansar. Fair enough. Um, I could have suggest I could have um speculated spires, but they they don't look like spires. Um, because spires have the big um the bulky uh. War suits, and yes, they like that. Do. basically like the the the, uh, the Iron Man suits, essentially. Um, yeah, we already have models for them. No, we don't have ones for the Malkadon or the Aurus or the uh, Jakara or Yeld. Oh, Cause, okay. Because the Yeld, for example, the Yeld, for example, has wings like massive bird wings. Oh god! And the guys basically got like a ma- guys basically got a sniper rifle for an arm. Jesus Christ! Okay. <laughs> yeah. Also, fun fact, and the names of those Spire of Battle suits, they also got retcon to being part of the Tau Lexicon as well. Oh. <laughs> so, Jakara um, is actually been retconned to be ta- the Tau word for mirror, and one of the main features of the Jakara suit has a mirror shield. Implying what? The, I mean, Necromunda goes back way before the Tau. I know, but the, in, in implying that it's a retcon that these suits were developed using Tau technology is a retcon. Ah, I'm with you. Because, like, um, Aurus is derived from the Tau word Aure, which means powerful, and it's the most physically powerful suit. Um, the Malkadon, um, which is basically like a spy like suit, derived from Malkaeol, which is Tau for spider. Malkaeol, Malkadon. Yeah, I've heard yeah. that one. So there are subtle links. Again, this would be a case of a retcon. Yeah, but I mean, we'll see. Um, either way, though, I'm sure if you're saying about this mysterious skull cluster, that seems like a really interesting place to take Necromunda into the forbidden depths of hell. Mm. It could also be one that's infested with gene stealers, because there was, also, there was a hive that was infested with gene stealers. So, of course. Because of course there is. Because Necromunda has, it has orcs, it has gene stealers, it has literal shark people. Scalies. <laughs> yeah. It has Cthulhu on there as well, apparently. Computer, will you stop? And we just find out actually just Yogg Saron instead. Yes. Oh, sorry? sorry, my computer's doing the thing again where Battle.net's yelling at me saying, do you want this to make changes to your computer? I'm just going to go and un- uninstall Battle.net. It heard me mention Yogg Saron. <laughs> it heard me mention Yogg Saron, that's why. Yeah. How does, I don't even know how you uninstall bloody Battle.net. How do you even uninstall it? Exit. There we go. Exited um, it. 
now do. <laughs> really, yes. Sorry. But yes, there's one last bit from Adepticon. I mentioned it earlier, and it's Dawnbringer's Book 6, which has got one of the coolest Chaos minis I've ever fucking seen. Oh, yes, um... The Spear of the Everchosen, isn't it? Indeed. This is basically Archaon's answer. Do you remember the Chaos Stormcast? Yes. So that was a Bellacore guy. This is Archaon's girl. Um, so she is like first among the eight circles of the Baron Guard. She's right up at the top. She's actually now, I think, the leader of the Swords of Chaos. Um, she's Well, she killed the best contender for leadership of it that so she's definitely right at the top of leadership underneath Archeon himself. Fair enough. Um and that spear was a gift from Archeon, Gul Gorbolga the Accursed, which is a nigh uncontrollable spear. It's his way of saying, look at this amazing gift. If you even try this, this thing is going to kill you. So it's a way of keeping her in check. Uh and she's going I'm getting some I'm getting some strong Valkyrie the Bloody vibes, just without the wings. I see where you're coming from, yeah. I mean, the beast itself, the Thanatorg, which is what it's called, is a, a really cool mount as well. A, a great evolution on the Karkadrak and all of that. I think it's a great model in general. And the box she comes in um, as her sort of launch box is a box with Varangard. So she's basically the Varangard HQ, which is great because when I looked at Slays the Darkness, obviously we talked about the Dark Oath last time round. Um, mm -hmm. And the Dark Oath and the Varangard sort of present the two threats in Dawnbringer Book 6. Uh, the Dark Oath are going after um, the Axian side, and she's going after the Gyronite side. Um, and I always remember when I looked at Slays the Darkness and thinking, do I want to get into Slays the Darkness and Warriors of Chaos? It was always, I want to make a Varangard style army. Like, I really want a hyper elite army. And they've given me all the tools now with her Chaos Thors on Karkadrak. Varangard, and now the Dark Oath as well. Like, I'm not going to do it on financial grounds, but this is the this is now a position where I would love to be getting into Slays the Darkness. I think they're in a great position as an army to play um, for me, but I'm not probably going to be able to. Either way, though, great mini, and we'll see how this ties into the whole Skaven thing that we mentioned earlier, and how this all ties up. Indeed we shall. Right, you wanted to talk about the Tau Codex, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I have a rant. Go for it. They're taking away customizable battle suits. Ooh. So. Ouch. Ouch. So, here's what they've done Crisis battle suits have now been separated from one data sheet into three, which allows you to take nine units of suits in one game, so that's a good thing. But here's the problem. Each of these keyword suits, they are called the Sunforge, the Star Scythe, and the Fire Knife. Um, basically have set options. So the Sunforge is Twin Fusion Blaster, the Fire Knife is Plasma Missile, and the Star Scythe is Burst Flamer. Uh, it, it, you may have exact variations. I haven't read the exact data sheets as to how many of each you're allowed to take. But A, doesn't look like you're allowed three guns. B, you don't have cyclic ion blasters and air bursting fragmentation presenters, projectors. And C, you can't mix and match within a squad. Oh. So you That's... now have specialised crisis suits to do specialised jobs, and you cannot take a mix and match, which is infuriating. Because I have got so many crisis suits built and glued together with mix and match builds to allow them to deal with any threat. Because when you're playing small games like I do, like, 500 points, 1,000 points. You don't have the space to pick custom suits for each role. You need a versatile mixed bag team that can do a little bit of everything and combine that with For the Greater Good with the new Retaliation card draw, which I'll come on to in a moment, or the Mont rules, or whatever. But now you can't do that. You take an anti-tank team, an anti-armor team, or an anti-infantry team. And that, if you're playing a mixed game, sucks so much ass and also means i need to yeah. break all my suits in order to fix them up into oh, new configurations no. including the 3d printed resin ones i bought not that long ago and oh. built as a custom set of optional weapon options that can do literally anything to be my new bodyguard team for farsight no thank you 
Also, the eight are now completely illegal, because you can't take, for example, Plasma Flamer Shield, which, guess what, three of the eight have got. <laughs> uh, oh, speaking of characters, um, Aunvar, Aunshi, and I think it's Longstrike aren't yeah, it's even Longstrike. in the codex anyway. So. And Longstrike yeah. is one of the best models in the book, so fuck that. <laughs> so, yeah, this so is... So basically, there's, there's like... No ethereal characters at all now, is there? No nope. play as. Nope. Ooh. Yeah, it's that's it, controversial. It's it's really annoying. They've also taken away the XV8 battlesuit commander, so you know how you could use like one model out of a crisis team as a commander. Yeah. No. Nope. Oh. You've got to take the enforcer or the cold star now. <laughs> it's basically games where I just went, you know, fuck you, tile players, but at least you've got some new crew models. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I get it because you've got to make sure that people who buy a squad of crisis suits can actually use them as a squad of crisis suits and not a commander, but it also fucking sucks. It really mm-hmm. sucks. And I'm really, really cross because as someone who glues her models because I cannot be asked to work out magnets and I cannot be asked with blue tack, I glue my models together. And also I've got the eight who are a specific build combination ting. I now can't fucking take them. I guess not, they're not in the codex either then. <laughs> of course they're fucking not. So literally, I can't take them. Well, okay, stand corrected. I can take Aracon. I can take Farsight. I can take Torchstar leading a squad of Star Scythe. I can take Brightsword leading a squad of Sunforge. But Shavastos, Bravestorm... Oh, no, Evasive is a Riptide. So Shavastos, oh, Bravestorm, and... Who's the third one with Plasma Flame and Shield? Hang on a minute, two seconds. Aracon, Show, Ovesa, Oblotai, Shavastos, Bravestorm, Torchstar, Brightsword. Oh, there's only two who've got Plasma Famous Shield, I can't remember. But either way, I can't take them all. Oh boy. <laughs> and it's. Yeah, I, mean, I know what Games Workshop's excuse is going to be. Uh, they died. Because Oblotai died, Brightsword died. That's no excuse saying one of them actually did die and was just brought back as an AI. That's well, not an excuse. Well, Oblotai <laughs> was, was an AI concerned. from fucking 7th edition, Ramlays. He's been an AI since 7th edition. I, I know. But the po- point is, is that, you know, killing him off, just bring him back as an AI. With yeah. the towel, that's not an excuse. Yes, yeah. and Bright Sword's a clone. Yeah, exactly. Like, the only one who's dead, dead, to dead, I think is Bravestorm. Like, Show's alive. I think Torchstar's alive. I think... Or well, Bright Sword's a clone. I think Ovesa's alive. Oblote's an AI. Shavastos is Shavastos. I don't know. Aracon's alive, I'm pretty sure. I mean, it's just... Oh, it's bullshit. It's absolute <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> but if you want to take a load of battle suits, they have given them a really good detachment, which says when you get within 12 inches, you get plus one strength. And if you get within six inches, it's plus one AP, which is really f- powerful. Like, and, and speaking of powerful, um, Hibu Khan. Yes, okay. Now you get to do the thing from earlier. Sorry for making you wait. It's all right. Yes. Um, who, if I recall correctly, was the guy who cut off Little Horus's face. Correct. He's also the only traitor white scar to ever get a model. He is indeed, yes. Because he turned traitor, realised he got it wrong, and was made head of the Sagyama Zan as punishment. Yes. So he's a traitor who then turned traitor against the traitors. He's also got Mark II armor, which you don't see very often. No, it's nice to see brand new Mark II armor, and I love the helmet sculpt. Mm. I I do it. It's great. I mean, I know people like to like you know rag on the whole you know, like top knot thing because top knots are common as hell in Horus Heresy, but it suits the white scars. Yeah, you know, and it looks really good on this armor. So yeah, the white scars having top knots is completely completely fine. And can we also just you know we we keep talking about it with Horus Heresy and. Uh, character models they didn't over design this one looking at you chaos lord from earlier because i've realized how over designed you are also no tactical rock either and no tactical rock yeah i mean looking at his pose it kind of looks like he's missing a tactical rock because he's doing an upswing mm. it still looks good though and credit to whoever painted the unhelmed um head you know painting the face paint on it looks great yeah they've done a really good job of making that look like proper stuff Warpaint. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So no, really good stuff. I'm very, very happy about that one. Um, great model. Really, really great model. Fair play. Yeah. Uh, and there was also okay. an old world almanac regarding the orcs and goblins. Just uh, maybe more of a painting guide looks like, but Well, I mean, it's also as an almanac, 
it's it links into their arcane journal because we knew the orcs and goblins were getting the first arcane journal post tomb kings and it talks about what's in there there's a bit of how they play and a bit of how they paint there's a few different ones of what you can do with them um I said this would be a tactics article if orcs cared about that orc tactics charge yeah pretty much but no it's it's good that um, they're getting on with it like we've got obviously tomb kings and bretons are done Orcs and goblins who've always got no minis but have got a really good raid refresh. Um, the dwarves have now got a really good, who are actually a really good solid core range, and now just get a good hero range refresh, which is good. So they're really getting on with getting models out there for Old World, which is obviously really good to see. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see who's next. I'm going to take a punt. Um, how am I going to take a punt? Actually, it's going to be an evil faction, but I don't know which one. Because it ain't going to be vampires. Beasts of Chaos? I don't remember if Beastmen were a Legends faction. I think Beastmen were part of the actual core factions. Yeah, I mean, a Beastmen refresh would be great because that would allow them to do something with um, updating Beast Lords and stuff and then put them in AOS too. Yeah, because I'm pretty sure it was Warriors of Chaos who are in it and Beasts of Chaos, but not Demons. No, Demons are definitely Legends, as so are Skaven. So yeah, that'll be good, and uh, eventually they'll get around to doing the High Elves, and then I really will have a conundrum. Yeah, let me check a look at the faction list. Uh, evil faction, Orc and Goblin Tribes, Warriors of Chaos, Beastmen, Brayherds, and Toon Kings. Oh uh, yeah, so it won't be Warriors of Chaos, because they've had absolutely butt-tons at the minute for Age of Sigma. Like, they've had the Dark Oath just recently. What they'll probably say is, you know, hey, we've redone Marauders, just go buy the Dark Oath box. Mm. I'm going to say it's going to be Bre- uh, Beastmen next, unless they decide to pick a second um good faction because there's like five compared to the four of the evil ones so yeah maybe i mean they don't need to do much with the empire to be honest they've still got all the old empire kits lying around and they've only got a few some things. new wood elves would be nice though new wood elves would be brilliant i know there's some people out there who are obsessed with wood elves so yeah i would definitely be happy to see wood elves redone high elves i think can wait because lumineth are right there if you're that desperate um yeah. So yeah. Oh god, can can you imagine with Widows if they decide to make a brand new model of Orion? They'd better. They had no, better. I'll sell for Ariel as well at this point. <laughs> yeah, it would. I mean, given that they've redone Ungrim Iron Fist, I wouldn't rule it out. Mm. Though I do think they missed the trick by not redoing Cetra. But I will stand by that. They missed the trick not redoing Cetra. Yeah, agreed. Like I get you've got to. You don't want to put them in the box because name character box game i get that they haven't done that since bloody carter sicarius but i do think they really should have redone cetra i mean they did it technically with burning a prosperer because they put aram in that okay yeah burning a prosperer's got aram in it um i don't think they've done it since Until... oh no there was a there was a 40k box that had um garen crow in it that grey knight versus thousand sons one. Oh yeah oh yeah i completely forgot sorry my bad that's all right. But yes, they don't do and it they, very often. And they just separate into combat patrols like about um, four weeks later or so. Yeah, something like that. So yeah, there's plenty going on. Um, we have sort of blitzed through on the new side of things, and there's two reasons for that. Thank you, Wind. Uh, the first reason is Adepticon. There is a butt ton. Uh, we're nearly done, so there's a couple more bits. Firstly, Horus got a joy toy. Mm-hmm. He did indeed. And get your mind out of the gut for those in the comments. Um, no, action figures. <laughs> yes, we. I hadn't even thought of that. Get your brain, people. Um, <laughs> we can also appreciate the fact that you've got a good bit of customizability in here. Obviously, you've got Worldbreaker. They're not calling it the Warmaster's Talon, are they? Um, they are. They're calling it the Warmaster's Talon, not the Talon of Horus. Are you kidding? <sighs> Talon Horus just sounds so much cooler. That's what it is. And they've made it as a match for Horus Ascended rather than, obviously, Horus Lupercal because you need to match up with Dawn in some way, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, it's really, really good. Um, and I, and you can actually take him with or without Worldbreaker, though why the hell you wouldn't take Worldbreaker, I don't know. Well, maybe you want to give him that tiny little knife he comes with as well. So you can shank some. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but if you think Primarchs are a bit too much, you could instead get Abaddon. Not the despoiler, Ezekiel Abaddon, uh, who has got 30 different articulation points and can either have his Paragon Blade or a Twin Bolter alongside his Gathonian Power Claw. And he's about 
six and a half inches tall, and they're available um, now. They're already available. Do you know what would be awesome? If um, Horus's uh, talent was actually detachable from the figure, you could actually give it to um, Abaddon. I'm that sure someone so cool. will try. Yeah. Just so you can reenact that one scene from, you know, um, Black Legion. Not Black Legion, Talon of Horus, rather, sorry. Yeah, it, one of the two books. Yeah, you know what I mean. That series, the ADV series. But yeah, yes. it would be lovely to do that. Uh, but I think it's still a great mini. And the guys over at Joy Toy who make all these, I, I know we sometimes rag on, haha, action figure, lol. But they really do a great job of designing them. Like, compared to, say, the McFarlane toys. And I know that's probably just... Oh, how... the McFarlane ones are terrible. They're, they're the crap ones. But it's how, I think um, the things with the McFarlane, I don't think they're actually badly designed. I think they just don't have good artists who paint them. Like, the paint jobs are awful. That... Yeah, that probably is a part of it. I think you need like, to compare... Did you see to that fact... bloody Blood Angel? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think the way you need to look at it is that um, McFarlane Toys is the cheap, cheap and cheerful option, whereas the Joy Toy is the um, the collector's range. And then you've got Weta Workshop over there doing them for a £1,000 a go. <laughs> yeah, fuck that. <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest, I don't laugh about the concept of action figures. I mean, I, I've got my Ultramarine Primaris Bandai figure, you know, sitting on my desk. Um, but I, I just laugh at the McFarlane ones because most of the McFarlane ones are genuinely pretty bad. Yeah. Um, I find, especially when you compare them to the Joy Toy ones, because the Joy Toy ones just have such better sculpting and paint applications, and they just look they just look better, even though they may be fractionally smaller. Yeah, and also it's worth noting that there's actually a squad of Justera and Terminators from the Relics Festival that you might have seen in the news the last couple of episodes. So there's I actually did, yes. so you can have a full squad of Justera led by Abaddon and Horus if you want. Which would be cool. Yes, it would. Uh, so yeah, lots of good stuff there if that's what you're into. Uh, there's a new uh, star player for Blood Bowl. Uh, a Wood Elf war dancer by the name of Jordel Fresh Breeze. I don't like the face. It. He looks like someone who's just eaten a bee. Yeah, like, look at the artwork, then look at the mini, then look at the artwork, then look at the mini, then look at the artwork, then look at the mini. It's fucking terrible. <laughs> Like, the rest of the model looks f- absolutely fine, and it would make a ver- great basis for, like, a war dancer conversion or something like that. Oh, they are it's a just war the dancer. face looks... Like, you know, I mean, for a standard war dancer from Old World, I mean. Mm. Like, for a war dancer champion, for example. Yeah. Just change the shoes, obviously. Because um, I'm pretty sure there's not too many, you know, Nikes and Nathan Lauren, but anyway. Um, but that face, man. That's just... Oh, I'll tell you what it reminds me of. Um, you know that meme, the smug cat with the knife being pointed at it? <laughs> Yeah. Oh my god, Raplaze, where do you pull these references from? From the internet, of course. <laughs> but it's also like I really quite like the weapon. Um I don't know what I'm I'm gonna call it the a hidden punch dagger. That's it. Sorry, yeah, because it's wrapped around his wrist, not in his hand. It's a punch dagger implies you punch, but he's got it around his wrist, not around his hand, so he can still pick up the ball, which is mm. good design. You just gonna call it the hidden blade because you you look you know, Will Ospreay and all that. No, bruv. it's Assassin's Creed. <laughs> In Blade, bruv. Yeah, Brian Downs in Manchester United, bruv, bruv. In it, bruv. Ah, oh, well, that's da, 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 da. <laughs> Yes, also, we got Skaven in 40k, sort of. Oh, the giant rats for Necromunda. Yes, so there's a Necromunda Beastmaster uh, with different ratty boys. Yes, and we all, we always love our giant beasts in Necromunda. They always look so great. Mm. And I have to say, like, if you're wanting to do Skaven conversions, then I think these are a great place to start. Um, for mm. well, it depends on what the scale is and how they match up to other Skaven minis. Because there's no way that that two-headed one will be anything like useful for a brood brother or a rat, a brood mother or a rat ogre or anything like that. What but... you could you, what you could use for it though, um, just trim like the torso a bit, stick on a pair of legs, and have it just like a as a basis for like a Skaven warlord just has two heads. Yeah, you know, something similar to that Blood Bowl player, um, Hack Flem Scuttle Spike. Yeah. Because he's got like you know the, the rags over that second head, so you could also make it like like a plague priest or something. Yeah, or you could call him Kairos Fate Chitter because one's blind and one's not. Hey, <laughs> see, I can make puns. <laughs> you can. But yes, they are nice little minis, and uh, Necromunda always does a great job with mini design. Like genuinely, I can't think of well, I'm sure you can, but off the top of my head, I can't think of a bad Necromunda mini from the new range. Yeah, the only one I can think of was, was that um, 
That's that cycle in the floating chair, but that's mainly due to how crap the paint job was. It looked like it was painted in watercolour. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it comes down not to the model, it comes down to how it's painted. Like, the amount of good models that look crap when people paint them is high. Yeah. And I say that as someone who does this on the regular. <laughs> mm. uh, is there anything from the past? Obviously, I appreciate it. it's been a month since you last sat down with us. Is there anything? Oh, I wanted to ask your opinion on Book of the Year. Oh yeah, um, I have, I have problems with this list. Where's where is the list? I can find it. So can Here you go. I'll, I'll copy it over to you. Here you go. Ah, much obliged. Uh, don't know why my accent changed. Where'd you go, Irish? Really That's crap. my job. That's my job. Hmm? Is that why you come here to me? <laughs> um, right. Um, I'll say this: Cipher had no business even being in the top ten. That book was not good. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I can't speak in regards to any of the Caiaphas Kane books I've not read them nor can I speak about Warboss I've not read that but there's an anthology there why is there a fucking anthology in the top 10 I have no idea um, End in the Padding Volume 2 does not need to be at number 3 <laughs> it shouldn't be there at all <laughs> like I, I, I could buy it being in the top 10 but not number bloody 3 um was it Gene Father at num- number nine? I, I, I can see her being number nine. I, I would have put her around nine or ten. I mean, it was, it was Guy Hate's best book in a long time, but with a lot of his recent work, that's not really high praise. But I digress. It's still Fall praise. of Cadia. Yeah. Fall of Cadia at number six. Fall of Cadia, I found to be an entertaining book. It was riddled with lore and accuracies. Like, you know, like, oh yeah, here's a Black Templar lieutenant, despite the fact that Black Templars. Never make use of left hand rank. They have their own equivalent of left hand, but even then, that wasn't introduced until after the advent of the Ultima Founding. Indeed. When Gilliman reintroduced the left hand rank into the Adeptus Society to begin with. <laughs> but aside from that, though, it was an entertaining book. Um, End of Death Volume 1 at 7. Yeah, I can see it being there. Acceptable. Um, that's acceptable, yeah. End of Death Volume. Uh, End of Death Part 3. At number two. Now, we haven't discussed this in full yet, so I don't know what you think of this. No. I don't think it should be that high. It, it's it's better than part two. I will give you that. And I think a lot of people can agree it was better because it was nowhere near as padded. However, with this one, I think this one's more chalked up to recency bias. Yeah, because I remember seeing it at the, uh, up there, and like, particularly the Lion book being up there, and I was like, Rem is not going to like. I don't know. I didn't really want to judge what you were going to say about End of the Death Three because you hadn't because you hadn't told me about how you thought about it went. But I saw the Lion book up there and I was like, Rem is not going to like this. Again, I thought the Lion book was all right. I wouldn't necessarily have put it at number one. No, and but I, I would have. Sorry. Top ten, yes, I would agree. It would be. It would deserve to be in the top ten, but not necessarily at number one. I think the element of it that someone pointed out, one of the girls pointed out during the recording, is a shit ton of people have read it because it's a Primark novel. And by default... I I can agree with that, yeah. I I think that's why End and the Death is so high. It's why the Lion novels are so high. It's simply people bought them en masse. This is not a contest of what was the best book. It's a popularity contest. And because there's three parts to End and the Death, their votes got split, meaning that lion snuck in and won because people wanted to know what the hell was going on with the lion because he was asleep having a nap and now he's back yeah and a, a funny thing is you know stuff that I was mentioned in the lion novel yeah the new dark angels codex completely ignores it oh, <laughs> oh for god's sake so basically sake. so effect- effectively this line this novel was a complete waste of time <laughs> oh. that's, that's, that's harsh that's harsh um i think it's more a case of like one um, was written. They were written in parallel, and they weren't talking to each other. Yeah, it's it's a case of Games Workshop and Black Library not knowing where to, you know, wind their ass or scratch their watch. Um, yeah, and I think the other problem is because I think there is an issue in, in Games Workshop of departments not having a shared time scale and communication. Like, yeah, I fully accept the Lion novel comes out when the Lion's model comes out when the Lion's rules comes out. I accept all of those things. However. I get the feeling that the rules for the Lion and the Dark Angels Codex were written long before that novel was put to paper, or that novel was being started Probably. when the Dark Angels rules were being finalised. Mm. Wouldn't shock me. I can me. see that. 
also, uh, there was one thing I did see quite a few people complain about online. Um, because like every time there is a vote for the best book of the year, the top 10 is pretty much always 40k. Yeah. Always. Minis and, yeah, and I know we, books. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know we, you know, focus on 40k primarily and less, you know, there are more books that do come out for 40k. But I think it might be better in the future Games Workshop to have a separate list like best 40k book of the year, best Age of Sigma book of the year, or Age of Sigma slash fantasy. You know, yeah, I to mean, go with 40k I, slash Horus Heresy. I think the yeah. play is to follow the Golden Demon for that. In that you've got different categories for AOS, 40k. If you just want to do other at that point, because obviously heresy, well, you want to have a separate heresy category, maybe a other category for like Necromunda, crime, horror, old world, yeah. yada yada. And then have your Slayer Sword equivalent, your book of the year, let's, let's call it the, I don't know, the Grand Tome. Administratum Scribe. Yeah, whatever. Have yeah. a book of the year, but give enough room for the novels in the other genres to thrive. Because like, I yeah. know... I, from what I read in the past 12 months, if I just go to my Apple books, because that's where I keep mine downloaded, my ebooks, is I know for certainty that I read more good AOS fiction than I did 40k fiction. Like, God Eater Sun the was brilliant. The Interest Novel was standing. The Interest <laughs> Novel was okay in the end, if you saw my wrap-up. Oh, was it? Well, yeah. did, you might but have like, seen the wrap-up. I just remember um, off the top of my head from the first time you talked about it and you were so like, I'm so bored. <laughs> yeah, and literally Andrasta turned up on the next fucking page and the novel got good. So, <laughs> but like, yeah, God Eater Sun, way, Children of Teclis, the Andrasta novel up to a point, Blight Slayer, all the Goat Trek stuff. Like, there have been so many good novels and I do think that all the great work AOS does in its literacy department, in its miniatures department, just gets overshadowed because it's a smaller fan base. People just go, yeah. oh, there's more 40k players, so it's a popularity contest. Because one of the things I did hear in regards to the 40k books, because I have seen a few people complain about this, and that's the fact that um, Harrowmaster wasn't on the list. It didn't make the top ten. That's uh, the Alpha Legion novel, right? Yeah, because the people who said they've read, the people who read it, pretty much all of them said that the book was great. And the fact that I didn't make the top ten, it's like, well, that's kind of... That doesn't make the top ten, yet um, the Caiaphas Cain anthology does. Yeah, it's it tells me, it's sort of it's like anything. It's a popularity contest, but the problem is it's not a fair popularity contest because there are different size groups voting in different levels of the contest, yeah. but their votes are counted equally. Like, I'm not saying we need to go over to some parliamentary system where the 40k fans get a certain percentage of the fucking vote, because that doesn't make sense. <laughs> but no. it's but the, it, make, it makes no sense to see, like, Cypher in the top ten when Storm of Iron was on the nomination list and I didn't even get in a, a vo- you know, a look in. Yeah, and I... I know all the crap you talked about the Cypher novel, about X, about Y, and I'm sat there with like three or four great novels from Warhammer Crime, Age of Six, like King of the Spoil. King of the Spoil was amazing. Mm. And it won't get a look in because Warhammer Crime is a niche section. And it's, it's, yeah. sus. and I can imagine for the Black Library authors as well, it must be quite demotivating to pick up AOS fiction if they haven't got that, say, security in terms of, you know, commission, contract, finances. Because if you're going to yeah. write an AOS novel, then you know that it's not going to be as bought and as read as a 40k novel and will not receive the same critical acclaim as it should. Now, that's not to disparage the 40k writers, because they're fucking amazing. Hello, Robert Rath. Hello, and many, many others. Sorry, I had the Infinite Divine on the brain. But, you know, there are great books in all of the genres. But taking on an AOS novel is a labour of love not a labour of profit, necessarily. or it, Certainly if you're an aspiring author, and by all means, someone correct me if I'm wrong here, but if you want to make your mark as an amazing like black library author and get yourself those big commissions to take on these big projects and be listened to when you pitch something, I would wager that you need something to go off of. And an AOS novel that sold okay, but never amazing because it's AOS, or God forbid, Old World, suddenly that doesn't give you the same leverage or financial security compared to, here's a pretty decent 40k novel. It will sell well because it's a pretty decent 40k novel. now, And it discourages people who maybe want to take AOS on from taking it on because there's less of a guarantee that it will be 
a money spinner or a name maker. And I'm willing to be corrected here because I'm not an insight into the writing industry, but that's my expectation. I think also one thing that's also an issue when it comes to AOS is that the only authors who would probably be willing to do it are the ones who would be able to write a book fairly quickly. Because do you remember um, when we had ADB on? And I did. he said that, like, the reason that he didn't write any Xenos books is because he's a too, he's too slow a writer and the Xenos books generally at the time did not sell well. So basically, you know, if he's going to spend a long time writing a book and it's not going to sell well, what's the point? No, kind of absolutely. Thing. And that's absolutely the case and is probably why you don't see James Swallow, ADB, Dan Abnett and co taking on Sigma novels. It might just be that they're not that enamoured with the universe, and if so, so be it. But I reckon there's some of them who are like, I've got a great idea, but by the time I've written it, I won't get back what I need in sales. But the difference that their name could make being put on, this is the AOS novel by Dan Abnett. Like, yeah. his name Cause... would carry so much weight. Oh, it would. Um, yeah, because, like, I think the biggest name who was consistently writing AOS novels was Josh Reynolds. Yeah, because he put he, he was putting out so many books in AOS. Like he did like the Soul Wars book, he did the Nagash book. I'm pretty sure he did the Neferata book. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I could also like looking at who writes some of the other stuff. Um, John French wrote the Hollowed King, but that was a one off. Yeah. Darius Hinks wrote a Go Trek novel, but that was a one off. No, no, correction. Darius Hinks wrote. David Geimer as well wrote some Go Trek novels. Yeah. I think with Go Trek though, you got already the built-in rec- name recognition of the Go Trek brand because that's been going like that's probably the lo- Black Library's longest running series. Now the Heresy's because, over, yeah, yeah. Because like remember the Go Trek books started before the Heresy books did. Oh yeah, Point. they start they started around the same time. Um, in fact, they actually started before Gaunt's Ghosts. Jesus Christ. Because remember when Black Library started putting out the 20th anniversary books, the first one that came out, well, the first two books that came out, was Space Wolf and Troll Slayer. Good God. And then after that, it was like um, First and Only and 13th Legion. Um, yeah. And then after that, we got things like um, Soul Drinker and um, stuff like that. Yeah, it's strange. We never got a 20th anniversary of Fire Warrior, though. Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking on the AOS. Um, page on Black Library, just out of curiosity. Like, Guy Haley's written the Drecky Flint novels. Callison and Toll is being written by David Annandale. But, like, beyond that, I... Not really. I, Andy Clark wrote A Bad Loon Rising. He wrote one book. But Noah Van Guyen is probably what... And Richard Strachan are two of the main AOS writers. Um, and they're brilliant like i've read loads of their work like the andrasta novels noah van guyen god eater sons noah van guyen blight slayers richard strachan the vulture lords richard strachan uh i think some of the old lumineth books oh no they're del lucas um but like there's not that same name power attached to sigma novels for the reasons i think we've discussed like the time investment versus money back and also the recognition that that novel will not get because it's not a 40k novel or it's not a heresy novel and i think games workshop's been incredibly protective of the heresy they haven't just letting writ letting any tom dick or harry write for the heresy pretty much they've not really given many people a go at heresy unless they're established i'm going to be corrected there but that's the vibe i get excuse me no you're fine you're fine but no it's right. what well, it is what it is it is what it is right um, I suppose you're all wondering what happened in part two of In the Death Part Three. Yes, the parts here. Parts. Yeah, I, uh, I've been, I've had to wait for six weeks, six <laughs> weeks to hear this, and I, I I could have gone and read the spoilers. Like I know it's going to end in the Emperor kills Horus, Horus nearly kills the Emperor, yada yada yada. But I've deliberately withheld myself from reading the deep dark spoilers because I was waiting. So, <laughs> so thanks, right. Rem's laptop. Consider this your spoiler warning. Also, as a caveat, because it has been several weeks since I've finished reading the book, I may get some details wrong. I may misremember certain things, so please bear that in mind. Um, If I do get things wrong, leave a comment down below. 
Right, entering the spoiler room in three, two, one. Cody's not winning at WrestleMania. <laughs> right, um, we left off with the Emperor and Horus starting their fight, and it's a huge fight. Like, you know, lots of, basically, think Dragon Ball Z, you know, flying around, punch, 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 that kind of thing. They're fighting in real space. They're fighting in the warp, and when they're fighting in the warp, you get some nice callbacks to some things that were mentioned in the old Realm of Chaos books, like, you know, the Veil of Creatures and the Forbidden Stare. Um, they're fighting in Horus's mind. They're fighting on the surface of Chthonia. They're fighting, they're punching, they're stabbing, they're stabbing, they're sh- shooting eye lasers at each other. Seriously, they're shooting eye lasers at each other. Okay, I, I I understand now why they needed to give this thing room to breathe, but also calm the fuck down. And then they have a game of Yu-Gi-Oh. Wait, what? <laughs> Hang on. They start using de- they, they start using decks of tarot cards to attack each other with. So basically, they're playing a game of Yu-Gi-Oh. Oh um, my like, I, god! I cast Revelation, so I counter with the spoiler. You've activated my trap card. Uh, <laughs> Dan, Dan, I love you, but what the hell are you doing? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm sure it's not, but I've seen some people turn around and say, "Is this, T- is this a TTS reference?" <laughs> if it is a TTS reference, then it's the best thing ever. And fair play, but also, Dan, what the fuck are you doing? Calm down, you've got a book to finish. Yeah, but they're having their um, their Yu-Gi-Oh battle. They're basically throwing tarot cards at each other. Um, it gets to a point where the Emperor loses his weapons. So he starts magically uh, conjuring pentagrams out of the air using sigilite magic and using them as ninja stars. What? <laughs> Why do I feel like every... I, I keep putting myself on mute so that you can't just hear me having a drink or whatever in the background. But every time you say something, I just feel like I have to unmute and just go, what? <laughs> Basically, um, this this fight scene, it's an, it's an anime. Just imagine it as an anime. It's basically Dragon Ball Z mixed with Final Fantasy VII Cloud vs. Sephiroth or whatever. Um, just imagine one winged angel playing in the background, not Kenny Omega's finishing move, the other one winged angel, thank you. Um, but yeah, meanwhile, while this is all happening, um, some demons are trying to make their way to Sanguinius's corpse, and Leetu's like, well, since I can't join in the fight because they're literally moving faster than I can track them, I'm just going to you know, twat these demons with the back of my sword, you know, get off his corpse, get off his corpse. These demons are getting a bit bigger, they're getting bigger. Go away, go away, get get bigger, getting bigger. No, go away, leave the corpse alone. Meanwhile, Loken is in another plane of existence currently. Um, uh, for what the hell is he doing? He's wandering through basically like this field and he sees like a campfire with a wooden chair in it and an old man sitting on the chair in the middle of the campfire he thinks it's basically a representation of Malkador and Logan says so Malkador are you going to help? the old man just says nothing It's like alright fuck you I'm going to carry on <laughs> and then he ends up in basically like this, this ruined pool you know this watery pool with a reflection of the moon you know on its surface whatever and he realises Oh, this is where I became a member of the Mournival in book one. Wow. That's a good callback. Well done, Dan. Yeah. And he hears um, four figures approaching. No, sorry, three figures approaching. Uh, that'll be Horus Aksum and Ezekiel Abaddon and um, the other one. Uh, Tarek Torgan. And... That's his name. Yeah. Um, it's not. Oh. It's a trio of centaurs. Uh, all with Horace's uh, face. Uh, all on with bows and arrows. Goodness sake. Dan, what were you on? <laughs> it, it gets better. Um, better? Centaurs are basically... Yeah, it gets weirder, so I should say. Oh, God. <laughs> right, but we'll get to that in a bit. So, the centaurs are basically saying to Loken, like, you betrayed your... You broke your vows. You swore your bonds of loyalty to Horus. And Loken's like... I didn't betray my vows. I kept my vows to the Emperor because I swore to serve the Emperor above all else. You betrayed your vows when you turned against him. Oh, but you you broke your vow against you know your father. You swore a vow to him. Yes, I did. But I kept my vow to the Emperor. That's what matters. Anyway, let's have fight. <laughs> Basically, that's just a no, I'm right. No, you're right. No, I'm right. No dick measuring contest. Just, ugh. Just yeah. skip it. It's like, that could have been solved a lot quicker. It's like, you're a traitor. No, you're that's basically it. You're a traitor. No, you're a traitor. No, you. No, you're a traitor. No, you're a traitor. Why don't we just kill each other and whoever survives isn't a traitor? All right. Bang. Yeah. Loken ends up killing all three centaurs. Because naturally. of course he does. Because he's Loken. He has a job to do, and that's to go die on the bridge. 
Please um, tell me he's the one that dies on the bridge. I'm not saying anything just yet. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> I'll get to it when I get to it. Calm your tits. Anyway, um, yeah, Horus and Emperor still has fight, um, and they did make one retcon to the fight. Like, this time, the Emperor is not hesitating. Instead, they just basically scaled Horus's power exponentially. He's just that much more powerful this time around. Yeah, because the original theory goes that the Emperor was pulling his punches because he still didn't want to kill his son. It wasn't a theory. It wasn't a theory. Originally, that was the reason. He was hesitant because he he still wanted to believe that Horus could be redeemed. That was the original story. This time round, it's like, no, Horus is just that much stronger than the Emperor. That's why Horus is able to beat the ever-living shit out of him. I think the reason for that is because they've made the Emperor into an uncaring bastard. So it made no yeah. sense for him to pull his punches. No. So I, I, I have no problem with this retcon. No, it makes sense. In the context of the In Emperor, fairness, it makes sense. Not only that, it also helps build up Horus as a more legitimate friend. Like, he's just that much more powerful than the Emperor, who's like a god-tier psyker. He's more powerful. That yeah. just makes him a more devastating threat. No, I can't argue with that. Yeah. But yeah, um, they fight, they fight, and then Horus caves in the Emperor's skull with his mace, kills him. And Logan's like, Logan's who's shown up is like, like, Horus, what have you done? It's like, I finally did what I needed to do. I am the Warhammer 40,000. Um... And there's the I was there the day Horus slew the Emperor line, right? No. No, that oh, line doesn't actually get said at all. Oh, I'm disappointed and down. Oh, yeah. fuck off. All that yeah. build up. Horus just killed the fucking Emperor and Loken doesn't even get to monologue the line to himself. That's, that's a mistake. The reason why is because they start having a basic debate. It's like, well, now you've done what you want to do. You don't need chaos anymore. You know, you can shed it from you because chaos is going to corrupt you. You can't control chaos. Chaos controls you. It's like, no, I will control chaos. No, you won't. It will control you. It's like, uh, well, maybe, maybe you make a good point, but hang on. Loken, if I'm talking to you right here, who's that over there? And looks over, and there's Loken. He turns back, and the Emperor's like, surprise, motherfucker. Bang. <laughs> yeah, he uses power to basically disguise himself. It's like, bang. He was like, haha. Like, I know the Emperor is a fight. perpetual, and he was going to get back up, but also for fuck's sake. No, no. Hor- Horus, di- Horus didn't kill him. It's like, the Emperor disguised himself as Loken. <laughs> so, who did the em- So, hang on. It was an illusion. It was an illusion. Oh. Yeah. They has fight. Emperor using his pentagram ninja stars. It's like, uh, and Horus is like, oh, your sigilite magic. That's so stupid. Anyway, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. Beat, 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 punch, 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 stabby, stabby, stabby. The Emperor's now broken. Like, close to death. Horus picks up the Emperor's body. It's like, right, all I wanted from you, Dad, was for you to acknowledge me. Acknowledge your tribal chief. You know. If he, now did he, put- if he told me he didn't actually say acknowledge me, please. No, no, no. Oh, thank but, God. Um, he starts carrying the Emperor's corpse over to the series of thrones that he had built for, you know, Emperor, Dawn, Valdor, and, you know, Sanguinius. And he basically wants to instill the Emperor on this throne, like a, a perverse copy of the Golden Throne, in a sense, where basically, like, he becomes enslaved to chaos. It's like, right, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stick you on there, don't, don't worry, it's for your own good, Dad. And while he's talking, the Emperor's basically placed a hand on Horus's chest, and Horus is like... See, why can't you show me this kind of affection always, Dad? You know, I see what you're trying to do. Maybe maybe I have been a bit too harsh on you. Maybe I have. I don't know. And then the Emperor blasts him again. It's like, oh, I see what you've done. You weren't being affectionate when you placed your hand on my chest. You were just siphoning some of my power to turn it against me. You bastard. Yeah, that sounds like the Emperor. <laughs> yep. Um, but Horus just beats the ever-loving shit out of him even some more, sits him on the chair... And impales him onto the chair with those pentagram throwing stars. <laughs> yes. Oh, I know that sounds very weird. Just, again, just imagine this is an anime. It makes a lot more sense when you do. <laughs> yeah, it sounds a bit like um, that. <laughs> and Horus picks up this little crown he's got for the Emperor. Basically, like, you know, to effectively enslave him to chaos, whatever. And he hears a voice come from behind him. And it's the custodian from earlier. It's the custodian who's standing defiant. You know, like, you will not kill him. And Horus is like, huh, lol, zap, basically blast of energy to basically try and vaporise him. But the custodian's still standing. Oh no, what kind of bullshit is going on now? Yeah, Horus is like, the fuck? How the hell do you survive that? And he sees, like, a, this one spot on the, on the custodian's armour, which is glowing, 
with the mark of the sigil. It's like, oh, fuck Saint Malgador. Right, I'm just going to blast you again. Bang. There. You're dead now. <laughs> For real this time. So, Malgador plot armor. Malgador plot armor. Right. But as he's talking to um, the custodian, as they're having their little monologue, like, you shall not pass. It's like, watch me, bitch, kind of thing. Lee Tu uh, has basically swatted all these demons away from Sanguinius' corpse, and he's basically sneaking around in the shadows, and he gets to the Emperor. He's basically trying to pull these um, pentagrams out of the Emperor's body, trying to free him. He's like, come on, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, come on. And then Horse just grabs Lee Tu from behind. It's like, yeah, no, yeet. Just throws him. He throws him so hard, throws him so hard, he lands at the foot of the Chaos Gods. Right. <laughs> and the Chaos Gods are just watching this, and one just looks down, and Leech is like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, because the Chaos Gods are pretty much manifested on the Vengeful Spirits, it's almost at this point. Yeah, and, and no one drew a picture of Nurgle eating popcorn watching this, but hey, <laughs> what can you do? Boom. <laughs> um... But yeah, as this is all happening, um, if I remember the timing correctly, um, Shimmering Portal, out comes John Grammaticus and Alanius Pius. It's like, oh, right, right, we're on the Ventral Spirit, we're at the bridge, where's the Emperor? Oh, fuck, horse is standing right in front of us. Shit. Bash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, at this point, we get a callback to several books ago in the Siege of Terror series, where John Grammaticus speaks a word of Annuncio, which basically causes the entire bridge to explode. <laughs> right. Yeah, basically, he basically went Fusro Da at Horus. <laughs> Horus is knocked unconscious briefly. John Grammatic has now bleeding from his mouth most of his teeth missing. Well, yeah, he's like, just Fusro Da to Primark. Yeah. I think Spice is like, what the fuck happens? Like, right, John, we gotta go, we gotta go. And and Alanis Pius, sorry, Alanis, we gotta go, we gotta go. And Alanis sees the Emperor who's basically been, like, just fallen slumped onto the floor, because uh, basically Lita have managed to pull the things free. And he rushes over to the Emperor, and like, no, we got to give the Emperor the Anathane Blade. It's his only weapon he can use against Horus to actually permanently kill him. Oh my god, there are, uh, please don't tell me this comes down to Anathane bullshit. Go. Again. I'll get to it. Anyway. Ugh. You are so annoying, you know that. <laughs> I know. That's why you love me. But anyway. Um... Alanis goes, like, he's like, come on, take the sound thing, come on, come on, wake up, wake up, wake up. John, you need to go back and finish making the loop with a little ball of string, otherwise we'll never get here in the first place. But I can't leave you. Well, you have to. Go, go, shoot, shoot, shoot. And then Horus wakes up, gets really pissed off, starts stomping towards Alanis Pius. Alanis Pius gets, he picks up his last gun, you shall not pass, da, 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 da. And then he basically gets vaporized, like, turned to a cloud of red mist. Well, it's yeah. smash. Hello, world breaker. Yes. So yeah, they managed to incorporate both Alanius Pius and the Custodian um, Defiant parts into this one story. Yeah. I mean, admittedly, if 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 we were watching this... All they needed was a Space Marine Terminator. All they needed was a Space Marine Terminator. That yeah. was the kind of think, trio. I think it's worth pointing out, though, if you were watching this on TV, it's like, Horus has won, the Emperor is going to die, and interruption. And that's there with and, and interruption. interruption. It's, like, it's like, a I don't know, it, it feels like it's one Plot of them... Armor. Yeah, there's a lot of plot armor, which I know there has to be because it's the Emperor versus Horus, but you're like, how many interruptions does it take to get the Emperor time to rebuild? Like, this is Roman Reigns levels of interruption bullshit. Come on. Yeah. And now this time around, Logan actually, conf- the real Logan actually confronts Horus this time around, and they have a massive argument. It's like, I loved you, Dad, but you turned against the Emperor. So my dad turned against me. He's like, no, he didn't. Blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, no, actually, to be fair, the Emperor did not turn against you, Horus, because he never liked you to begin with. <laughs> uh, so why are you being so faulty, number 16? Yeah. Anyway. Um, they end up having this really long conversation. My screensaver's gone. Fuck off, screensaver. Um, this long conversation is basically debating back and forth. And it looks like Glocan's starting to get through to him a bit. It looks it looks like it, but it doesn't. Horace is like, no, too far gone, too far gone, mate. Um, but it looks like he's trying to get almost gets through to him because Horace realizes, like, no, Emperor's basically fucked now. I don't need the power of chaos anymore. You see, it's not controlling me. See, look, I can just expunge it from my being and not need it anymore. See, look. I can stop whenever I want. <laughs> I can stop whenever I want. The Emperor's dead. Well, he's not, because he's getting up. Oh, fuck. Uh, power of Chaos come back into me, and the Power of Chaos is like, oh, no. 
no, no, you say you don't need us anymore. <laughs> no, you, you're not we're gonna we're not gonna help anymore because you don't need us. So so literally if I get this right, Horus gets himself a power boost, kills the Emperor as far as he thinks he needs to, tries to get rid of the power booster, then realizes the Emperor is getting up, tries to go back, go back, go back, 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 and Chaos are just like, nah, you you you're fucked, mate. Enjoy dying. <laughs> Kind of, but he does end up pulling most of it back into him. Um, well, I'm surprised he was able to even expunge the power to begin with. Like, give him credit. Like, most people who are corrupted by chaos can't do that. Mm. The power of Loken. <laughs> anyway, um, they have fight, and this time, Emperor shanks Horus with the Anathame. Why does Horus it have to come down dead. to the fucking Anathame? I hate that thing. Because it was a plot point that Dan Abner introduced, so of course he's going to finish it off with it. No, but like... You know, Chekhov's uh, guns and all that. Yeah, but this isn't Chekhov. This is, I know it's Chekhov's gun, but like... I don't know. I, I know that... But the problem is they're doing it again in 40k. Literally, they're building the fucking Anathane to kill Gilliman. Like, can they just let go of this fucking knife? Please, let go of the fucking knife. It's literally... Like, this is the most powerful knife in all existence. It makes Drachnien and the Emperor's sword look like petty little bitches. Put the knife down, Games Workshop. <laughs> Put that cookie down now. <laughs> I mean, if you think I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. But like, they are obsessed with this fucking knife. Stop it. They love their MacGuffins. Anyway, um, just have, just literally have it be that the that horse tried to let the power go and redeem himself, and the chaos, and then realizes, oh shit, because he knows the emperor's not going to forgive him. Takes it back. He doesn't get it all back. The emperor gets up, knocks him down, and psychically just purges him to the point that it kills him. Like, that's what happened in the original story, is Horus kills, insert character here, the Emperor has his Beyond Redemption, and Fusrodar's his soul out. Like... Yeah. I, I will say this. It gets worse. Oh, but we'll get to that. Oh, God. Anyway, Horus is dead. Again. Horus is dead. For real, the Horus is dead, for real, this time. That's such an anticlimax. That's such an anticlimax. And the Emperor collapses from his wounds, falls unconscious. And at that moment, Dawn, Valdor, and the Alcastarians arrive. Valdor and the Alcastarians are crying now. It's like, no, daddy. Um, Dawn sees Logan kneeling beside um, the Emperor's body. Litu pulls himself back from our screen. He's like, I'm over here now, guys. <laughs> I'm, don't worry, I'm here too. And Dawn and Logan... Well, Logan basically gives Dawn some space so he can actually you know, spend some time with the Emperor himself. As like, right, we need to get the Emperor's body back to there. He's still alive, but only barely. As like, but we can't teleport off the ship because there's a scramble field preventing us from being from interrogating our lock-on signatures or whatever. Um, then Logan says to Dawn, by the way, you might want to pay a visit to um, Horus's trophy room. Why the hell do I want to do that? Oh, because um, your brother's skull's in there. So basically, Not his this corpse, is how- just his skull. Yeah, basically, this is how they're rec- they're recording how the Iron Hands got Ferris Manus's skull back. Because oh, originally, sorry, I thought you were still talking about Sanguinius's skull. Sorry, Don't. no, no, Ferris Manus's. Because originally, it was Gilliman who gave the Iron Hands back the skull of Ferris Manus. But I think it makes more sense for it to be Dawn in this case. Well, yeah, he was on the boat; he could go and get it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, the other Blood Angels show up. They see Sanguinius's corpse and like, Daddy, no, um, as they would be. Um, then Dawn um, basically like, rubs away um, the soot as on the um, dead Castarian's armor, and sees the sigil, um, the symbol of the sigil. Like, it starts to glow again, because basically, like, oh, Terra just locked onto the signal of the of that sigil. It's like, right, everyone, gather around, gather around, get everything in, get everything in. Come on, come on, quick, 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 quick. Right, um, you coming to Loken? Now nah, I'm gonna stay here for a bit. Um, okay, um, Lee, are you coming? Yeah, I'm coming with you. Okay, cool. They teleport away. Logan's still on the ship, kneeling beside a corpse of Horus. Then Abaddon and the Jesteran show up. And this is where Logan dies. The Jesteran move forward to try and kill Logan, but Abaddon tells him to stop. Abaddon steps forward, and the two have a civil discussion. Basically like, you were here when Horus died? Yes. Horus was too far gone, he let Chaos control him. No. Now, Abaddon... You are now the commander of the Sons of Horus Legion. Wait, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. This whole Horus was too far gone. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. He let the power go. He took it back in because the Emperor got up, but he was letting it go. He was not too far gone. 
And he only died to bullshit. He wasn't killed because he was too far gone. He was killed because the Emperor had bullshit. I'm sorry, that's wrong. He, no, he's too far gone that he used the power of chaos to begin with. Oh. As soon as he did that, he was too far gone. Right, okay, sorry. Abaddon, right. meanwhile, did not. Abaddon mm. basically remained more or less, quote-unquote, pure in comparison. And he still is. He's got the mark of chaos ascendant, but he doesn't take power from the gods, so he's taking that lesson to heart. Logan says to him, Right, Abaddon, you were commander of the 16th Legion. Orders. No, not just that. It's like, you have a chance here to make things right. Horus was corrupted by chaos. He was too far gone. You were following orders, but you now have a chance to make things right. You can go and speak with Dawn and surrender, and they will show you and the rest of the Legion mercy. Because the Imperium is fucked from the Civil War. Space Marine numbers are at all time low. They, they can't you. afford. They can't afford to get rid of Mason. Like, you have a chance now to do something good. I urge you to do this. And Abaddon's like, "There's no way in hell Dawn's going to let us get redemption. Dawn will hunt us down to the ends of the earth." Figuratively speaking, no. The only thing we can do is flee. We are going to flee into the Eye of Terror because that's the only place that'll be safe for us, and it's where we can hide from our shame. Effectively, however. You and I, Loken, we're brothers. Regardless of what size of the war we picked, we are still brothers. So I offer you a chance... To go. Well, it's basically, it's not just that. You can either leave, or you can join us, be a part of the Legion once again, no repercussions. So, no ill will. So Loken offers Abaddon an out, and Abaddon says no, but then has the temerity to offer Loken the same out. Really? Essentially. They're basically a way, like, you, we can be... Basically, like, you know, brothers again. You know, this war has basically fucked everyone over. And we we do need to purge the taint of chaos from the Legion. And I think you can help me with that. Are you willing to do so? And before Loken can respond, Erebus stabs him from behind and kills him. Fucking Erebus. And Abaddon's like, what the fuck, dude? Why the hell did you do that? And Erebus's like, well, I had to do that because if Loken didn't die... Then Samus wouldn't have been created. Yes, right, ladies and gentlemen, the death of Loken was responsible for the creation of Samus. I swear Loken fought Samus like four times already. He did. But remember, demons exist outside normal space-time. Oh. A demon can be born after it was destroyed. Oh my, oh my god, this is bullshit. Oh my god. I'm, it was bullshit. I am, yeah, I, I'm, I, so I'm, I'm so cross right now. Like, genuinely, they just... I know the story wasn't going to go that way, but... Abaddon being given redemption on a plate and doing exactly the same fucking thing that Magnus did, which is, I'm too far gone to be redeemed. What are you doing? No. Yeah, but the thing is, like, the thing is, in this case, though, Abaddon does have a point in regards to, like, yeah, knowing Dawn, knowing how much of an angry boy Dawn is, there's no way in hell he'd, he'd let the Sons of Horus anywhere near Terra yes, to get okay, but, uh, but Yes, yes, perhaps. But go the other way. You also know Gilliman's right on his way. You know Gilliman's there, and you know Gilliman is Captain Rational. He will put Dawn in his box if he has to. Like, I understand everything. I don't know if they do bring, if I remember correctly, they do actually bring him. It's like, well, Gilliman might, you know, argue on your behalf because he is the logical one. He does, you know, you know, practical theory and all that. If any Primarch's going to argue on your behalf, it would be Gilliman. Correct. But, but, but no one held Dawn will. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I um, agree. Uh, yeah, fair enough. Dawn will probably say, right, all commanders dead. He'll probably kill Abaddon, Aximand, anyone who's still alive. I accept Aximan's that. already dead. Yes, okay, just the first commander I can come off the top of my head. But he would kill Abaddon, absolutely. He would kill Abaddon. But I genuinely do believe that with Gilliman's logic of Dawn, we're doomed. We need to get unobserved. If we let them go, chaos will get its hands on them we need to stop this and if that means we kill them all then so be it we kill them all but we do not let them run we keep them here we kill who we have to and if we can reform them we reform them anyone who wants it gets it anyone who doesn't dies like genuinely gilliman's logic and loken's logic are sound as balls here and abaddon is being a petty little bitch about it and considering abaddon's like oh no we must flee because it's the only way to keep ourselves alive suddenly he's become the uber eager maniac of we must kill the imperium within a hundred or a thousand years like no remember though sorry remember though in the um first two black legion on the first black legion novel 
he Abaddon went into a self-imposed exile in this because basically he saw, he saw what the Sons of Horus had become. It's like this is fu- I want nothing to do with this. I've taken the vengeful spirit for myself. I'm fucking. I want nothing to do with you all. And it took basically guys like you know Iskandar Kaon and you know Lior and the other guys trying to find him. It's like look Abaddon, the the Sons of Horus need you. You are need the Legion needs you. Otherwise, the Legion will be dist- the Legion will die because the other trail legions want to wipe out the Sons of Horus for basically being the first to flee after Horus's death. And Abaddon's response was basically like, I don't give a toss. It's like, essentially. Um, they, obviously, they convinced him later on, but basically, that was Abaddon's army. He, he wanted nothing to do with it. Which does tie into the ending of End of Death Part 3. It does link into that, that character development. Yeah, I don't know. So, it's, it just, it's not... I, so, uh... I, I think it works better if you've actually read... Talon of Horus as well, because it does actually lead into Abaddon's character development there. It, yeah, it I, does lead him very nicely. It's like, okay, this does actually make logical progression. Yeah, I, I, I see where it's going, but it's just, I don't know. Like, Abaddon was all like, I will not repeat the mistakes of Horus. That Abaddon's entire gimmick is, I will be better. I will be better than Horus. I will do the right thing by my legion, by my brothers, by myself. And his whole shtick was rejecting the corrupting influence of chaos. The Imperium may have to burn, but chaos will not win. And he was given that opportunity. He was like, okay, we've made mistakes. Our Primarch's dead, and you probably want us all dead too. But you can't afford to right now. We have probably still got the second largest legion on paper, after all this, after the Ultramarines, possibly third after the Dark Angels. And we are willing to help you. Or at the very least, if we're not willing to help you, we are willing to be left alone. And we will leave you alone in turn. If you want my head, and you want our heads as a Mornival for what we have done, because we followed Horus, if that will make you feel better, so be it. But you need our numbers. And yeah, okay, redemption for the dead is a thing, and uh, giving traitors the option of redemption. And I think it would probably bite a bit less if Magnus hadn't been given the same offer by Vulcan. Like, and the Emperor. Like, they've had this offer put to them before, and their own hubris of, no, we're unredeemable. Uh, in, f- in fairness, though, it does seem like the events of um, Fury of Magnus were effectively retconned, because when... Uh, which, um... What was the name of the book of the Siege series that ADB wrote? Uh, was it... No, not Saturnine. Um... No, it was... Uh, it was... The, uh, Echoes of Eternity, that's it. Yeah, because in Echoes of Eternity, Vulcan basically turns around and says to Magnus, you know, during the fight, like, we never had that conversation. You... That was completely in your fucking head. <laughs> uh, fair enough. But no, I, I just feel like that bites a bit. of like, And I'm just reminded of the Doctor Who anti-war speech by Peter Capaldi. Like, you're all the same, you screaming kids, running round singing, oh, look at me, I'm unforgivable. Well, here's the unforeseeable. I forgive you after all you've done. And just like, just sit down and talk. Just, this is Abaddon saying, oh, we're beyond redemption now. Fuck it, we'll go. No taking accountability for your actions, no willingness to own up. Just run. Coward's way out. I'm just more annoyed at the fact that I didn't use a chance to say I was there when the day Horus threw the Emperor. Yeah, I'm so it. annoyed I never went for that's that. It. That's the thing that annoys me more. And also, um, fuck Erebus and fuck Samus. Yeah, I... Stop I, trying to make Samus work. It's never going to work. Yeah, I remember seeing like very, very, like, no spoilers, but someone being very angry, like, and by the end of the book, you will uber hate Erebus. Yeah, because it's his fault that Sam is the thing. Basically, it's his fault he created Jinder Mahal. <laughs> the jobber who gets beat, who's treated as a threat, but even though he's just like a, a massive jobber, he loses every single fight he's in. Yeah, it's it's frustrating. And I would be very curious as to what Loken's answer would have been there, because he would have really helped to keep Abaddon and the Legion on the straight and narrow. Hmm. But, no, Erebus got it, Erebus. Dickhead. <laughs> um... That's pretty much the end of the book. There are some other things, like little tiny little... Um... Oh. Did I mention about the Astronomicon last time? Uh, about the fact that it had gone to fuck? 
Right, because they actually managed to reactivate. The Dark Angels managed to reactivate it. Um, however, when they reactivated it, um, it was through the through the power of prayer, uh, Euphrates Killer and her uh, followers. Mm-hmm. And as they're praying, you know, the Astronomicon, you know, being sparked into life, one by one, all the um, refugees start basically like poof, 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 poof. Bursting into flames, essentially. Oh God! It's like, oh, we're we're the fuel for the Astronomicon. Oh fuck! <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. Um, and did they do the? What about the send off for Malkador? Did they get the Emperor back to the Golden Throne, or did Gilliman turn up in this book? I don't recall Gilliman actually turning up at the end of it, but they do do the send off, um, and Vulcan looks very sad um, because, of course, he does. Um, oh, one interesting thing though, um, during the fight for the Astronomicon. Because um, Typhus is using his powers to broadcast like a psychic miasma, which stops the Astronomicon from being relit. And Cypher, you know, Sahariel, uh, Cypher and two other librarians, yeah, Cypher and two other librarians, they basically go out to basically fight uh, Typhus to block the malaise just so the Astronomicon can basically be ignited. And the implication is that Cypher gets killed. The implication, basically, he gets his torso sliced in half by um, Typhus's war scythe. Well, it's not. It's, it's common knowledge that the role of the Lord Cipher changed from person to person. It's very unlikely that it modern does. day Cipher is Sahariel. So, yeah. So I, I just thought, like, are they gonna, really going to keep the Sahara? I don't know. They're actually going to go for the idea of someone else. Okay, fair enough. Well, it makes sense considering um, that modern day Cipher is a traitor of sorts. That they wouldn't have it be Sahariel who was an out and out loyalist. Well, he wasn't out and out loyalist. He was still a traitor technically. It's just that he had no loyalty to Horus or the Emperor. Yeah, uh, true. I suppose. I it just I think Zahari maybe had too much baggage to be the modern day run around magic bullshit cipher. No, I tell I tell one thing about this book that really pissed me off. Despite the fact, despite the fact it was alluded to in the previous book, we had no payoff to the Bethusa Narek storyline. Like um, they referenced it in the end of book two, you know, like Bethusa Narek still hunting Lorgar, and nothing. It's like. You, why do you keep referencing Bethusa Narek if you're not going to do anything with it? I don't and know. for those of you who don't know, for those of you who don't know, Bethusa Narek was the loyalist word bearer who teamed up with Eldrad Ulfran to kill a slan. I knew he had something <laughs> to do with the Cabal and all of yeah. that. I knew he did. Um, but actually, I think it may also be that, you know, you've got to leave the odd thread dangling because they're probably going to do a scouring series and they want to have something to do. Maybe. Still, it would have been nice to have some sort of reference like, oh, did he arrive on that same world that Lorgar's on, maybe? I don't know. You know. Yeah, I don't know. But, oh well. Um, yeah, I don't know. It feels like... I don't know. I, just listening to you describe it, I have a funny feeling that you're not as huge a fan of part three as you probably should have been. I'm sure it's extremely well written, but the actual plot beats are not great. It. I'll say this. It's better than part two. Ram, that's not by a compliment. Like a country, Ram, that's not no, a compliment. By, by, by a country mile, it's better than Is part Is it two. as good as part one? I'd say it's as good as part one. I'd say it is. Um, but as to it being, you know, number two book of the year, no, nah, sorry, I don't think so. Like, top, like, you could argue top five, maybe, but I wouldn't put as high as number two. Yeah, and I just, I think for me, the thing that pisses me off more than anything is that it actually did not come down to the Emperor actually won. I mean, I know the Emperor was never going to win, but I expected it to be the Emperor is broken to the point of anything and he just gives everything to destroy Horus or Horus lets his guard down or gets distracted or something. And then the Emperor... So it comes to a literal deus ex machina. (laughs) But it, 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 I, I understand that you've got to get the Anathane to the Emperor, but what I would have preferred is Horus is stabbed by the Anathane and the Chaos no Gods... No effect kind of thing. No, not no effect. I'm happy for it to have an effect, but the effect should be the Chaos Gods realise, oh, shit, he's done. And they abandon him. And then the Emperor kills him. Yeah, that would be better. Yeah, I agree. Like, just something as simple as the Anathane killed Horus is, A, it happened 60 books ago. It's already happened once. So it's a bit lame. I understand Chekhov's gun come full circle, yada yada. The only thing that could stop Horus was the Anathane. But that implies that the Emperor could not win a Horus Heresy scenario because a corrupted, chaosified, mega boosted Primarch beat him. Like straight up beat him. 
meaning that he actually could not have won in the Horus Heresy scenario, further just to find the Emperor's stupidity and hubris. Absolutely. I don't know, I just think, if you need the Anathane to be involved, have it be that John Grammaticus lunges at Horus after he's been Fus Rodard into unconsciousness, jabs it into his neck, and that's the chink in the armour. And also, we've completely abandoned the chink in the armour subplot from Sanguinius as well. That's been completely abandoned. Sanguinius' death was for nothing. Pretty much. <laughs> oh, I just, like, I understand you've got to tell the story you've been telling, but when you look at the story from the past, and I understand, you know, let the past die, yada yada, I'm not bloody Kylo Ren in here, but when you look at the story of the past of Sanguinius fights, a tiny chink in the armour, Emperor attacks, Horus kills him, just about, distraction, loss of control, loss of redemption, bang. Like, that, that that's the rough plot piece of the original story, if I understand it correctly, if I remember it right. More or less, yeah. But now it's Sanguinius fight, gets murdered for no reason, massive uber-mega soul-powered boss fight, distraction, distraction, beat down, distraction, beat down, distraction, distraction, equivalent to a brass knuckle shot, win. It was the power of the punch. William Regal reference, there we go. Like, the Emperor's li- William Regal. Like, literally, <laughs> literally, they've just turned Horus into fucking Cody Rhodes. <laughs> like, Mania 39, this is, this is Cody Rhodes. Distraction, distraction, beat down, distraction, beat down. Got him beaten, distraction. Random attack from something out of nowhere, pin. Oh god, Logan Solo Sokoa. <laughs> no, well... Kind of. I think he's more than one of the Usos because he doesn't actually attack. But I think Jake Alanius Pius is your solo Sokoa passing off the Anathane. It'd been worse if he bloody stabbed him with it and just killed him. He was just killed by a man like he's the Witch King or something. So, but, so basically it's not so much the Anathane as a Samoan Spike. <laughs> yeah, literally, this is Mania 39 Cody Rhodes. And do you remember what everyone did, did, thought about that match? Everyone fucking hated it. So... Why? It just it just doesn't feel like a satisfy. I understand, and we said this when they, we talked about the heresy, like, they were never going to wrap it up in a way that satisfied everybody. Like, I'm sure there are people sat there listening to this going, that's brilliant. It's come full circle. He's been defeated by the thing that killed him in the first place. If this weapon didn't exist, none of this would have happened. And Loken got his chance at redemption. Alanius Pius got to be there, etc., etc. And the Chaos Gods, it proves that Chaos is all-powerful but can be defeated by working together. I don't know. I'm sure there's people come up with a rationale for why they like this book. But when you just take the fact that Horus lost because he got distracted four times, Fus Rodard by a random Johnny, and allowing a handoff of a dagger from 50 years ago that just shanked him to death and didn't just, you know, take his powers away, actually fucking killed him... Like, it's not just that as well. It literally like vapor. Basically, just all that's left was a skeleton and armor. <laughs> yeah, like the Anathame killing him when he's in his human form. Fair enough, I can accept that. But this is like an ancient chaos weapon. Why on earth would anyone in the powers of chaos allow the Anathame to be anywhere near powerful enough to kill Horus? Unless they wanted him to kill. Like, it would have been better if Horus had got it, crushed Alanius Pius's skull, mounted it on the talon, as like, oh, this thing. I'll enjoy using this on you. And the Emperor just redirects, rolls through, and bang, and stabs him back through with it. And then Horus is killed by his own hubris. Fine. But if Horus is irredeemable, which is what they want us to believe, is that Horus is irredeemable, which he wasn't, then he should not be being killed by bullshit plot armor. He should be being killed because his redemption was not given or not taken and thus he was lost and he lost himself and he lost his life for it no he was letting go of the chaotic corruption if the emperor had stayed down for five more minutes then you know what horus would have been free and then the emperor gets up and sure okay we've got a problem with the anathema and probably the emperor kills horus but like genuinely horus won he didn't just you know beat the emperor to a pulp he actually won he got everything he wanted he got the Emperor dead, he got Chaos out, he was ready to go. And he just abandoned it because the Emperor just moved at the wrong moment, allowing him to be shanked by the Anathame. Fuck that. Sorry, I don't like it. And I know it was <laughs> never going to please everybody, but it just doesn't sit right with me. And with that, we'll come out of the spoilers. Um, so, yeah. Um, Cody Rose, ladies and gentlemen, Cody Rose. Yeah, um, yeah. 
The non-spoilerific summary, uh, I'm very glad I didn't spend my money buying this series, because it has not ended in a way that pleased me. But that's just a me thing, and I think it might just be me being petty. That's fair. I mean, like I said, I I thought the book was actually not too bad overall. Like, again, it was better than part two, by a country mile. But I do agree certain elements regarding the ending do feel a bit of a cop-out. But that's not to say it's it was entirely bad. There were there are moments of brilliance in it, but yeah, right. Um, man, yeah, um, have we got time for some questions? Uh, yeah, I don't think there's many on the previous episode, but actually we've got two episodes worth. So let's see what we can find, shall we? Uh, so there was actually one person asked the question about end and the death part three, which was uh, how did it go? Where's it gone? 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 Uh, not sure if I'm missing something. They found it disappointing. Too much emphasis on saints and mortals. Your thoughts? Uh, I I can see that, especially with the Astronomicon plotline. Uh, I won't get into too many details just because we come out the spoiler section for it. But I can definitely see where they're coming from with this. Yeah, fair. Right, next question. Do psychers have any real defense against weaponized blanks other than, you know, minions? Like, do the Eldar have a blank protection against Kalex assassins, or are they literally just going to be, minions go and hope they don't get near me? Basically, your defence against a blank is stay as far away from it as possible and preferably shoot it. <laughs> so, no, then. Not really, no. Uh, that's about homebrewing... Um, so this person's homebrewed a non-40k tank kit and has been back Hung in a background for a tank, would a single weapon, world, object, character, or vehicle be an acceptable entry to Homebrew of the Week, etc.? Yes. Yes. It would, okay. Yeah. Thought it would be worth checking. Um, do you think Vashtor could appear on AOS? It's certainly possible considering he is a demon, and we have had crossovers from previously um, exclusive demons to one realm or another appear in the other one, like he had um, Doombreed. You know, a Terran born demon prince show up in AOS as Andrasta's main rival. Yep. And you also had um Quethel get name dropped in um in in the Siege of Terror novels, and he was a Skaven demon prince. So it's certainly possible he could too at some point in the future. Like I, I can imagine like if they do like a, a full Chaos Dwarf reign, for example, in AOS, I can imagine Vashtor showing up to help them at some point, because they're very technologically inclined. Yeah, I don't know if the model's too mechanical. I understand they have soul grinders and things like that. I just worry that the model might be a tad too mechanical and sci fi y to get away with it. I think law wise, it'd be great to have him. But the things he I think does, he like, get away with it. the things he controls machines and technology, and the problem is weapons like black powder cannons and things like that don't actually require any manipulation whatsoever. So I don't know. I think it's a nice idea. I just don't know how well it would cross over with his. I'm sure you could find a way, especially with like um, like with some of the scaven weapons, like the rattling guns and the gisels, and they got like doom wheels and like effectively what are tanks essentially. And it was wasn't there like also um, a a sigma character who's literally riding a robot horse? Yes. There you go. <laughs> Steampunk. There you go. True. Oh, and there you got go, Caradron. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So there are there are ways around it. Okay. Um, and someone just says, before anyone says it, Hashut is not the equivalent, because Hashut is not the god of technology. But yes, fair point. No, he's, he's actually the god of greed. Yeah. Um, that's a question regarding hosting down the line, because obviously I'm sure you heard last episode, I was talking a lot about time commitments and managing to keep this going for nearly seven years on a two-week rotor for so long, and it's worth looking at a rotation um, where when scheduling becomes an issue or expanding the roster so that Narina is more of a permanent position or whoever, I don't know. I mean, it's something we can look into down the line. I think this is one of those situations like we have to cross that bridge when we come to it kind of thing. Mm. I do I do think so. It's, But I know it's something that's on my mind is just time commitments of... No, of course. I, I understand like what's going on in your life and all that, so I understand completely. Um, we'll work something out. Yeah, we will. And it's just a case if we need to be organised with it, and me and Rem, I think, just need to Absolutely, sit down yeah. and get it done. Right, let's go look at the other episode then, um, and see what's there. 
Good warning against your breasts. Yes, we did a good job with that. Uh, two, actually. Uh, how long is it until all named marine characters become as old as Dante was when his super old thing was his thing? I'm not sure I understand the question. So, you know how Dante was super old? Yeah. Before the Primaris and all that. How long will it be until all the other named characters get that old? A few centuries, at least. But it's been... We did a 200-year time jump, didn't we? Yeah, but... Or did they retcon well, I that? Think, like, I think, I think we've, they retcon that with Knife, didn't they? Yeah, because I know they did the time jump for Dark Imperium. And did they then retcon it when they redid Dark Imperium and everything? But, the, I mean, the Indomitus Crusade... They did, yeah. The Indomitus Crusade Dark went Imperium, on a while. Yeah, but... Um, Originally, 8th edition took place after the Indomitus Crusade had co- had finished. But right now, uh, Dark Imperium books take place during the Indomitus Crusade. Yeah, I mean, hold on a minute. I'm going to see if I... I appreciate they don't really do timelines anymore, but let's see if I can get a date. No. Um, but even with, like, a 200-year time jump, like, someone like Marnus Calgar, for example, he was, like, what, four, five hundred years old? So even with a 200-year time jump, that'll make him at most, like, 700 which is still, like, half the age Dante would have been around that same time. What about Logan Grimnar? Logan Grimnar's probably your closest you have, because um, I think he was, like, 900 or something. Okay. So uh, that would so so, require, like, about 500-year time jump, I think. Yeah, so, apparently, uh, there's a reference... Uh, what's reference 18? In the Black Library preview online in May 2020, the Triumph of Rorkos was about... 12 years after the first as was when the first phase of the Indomitus Crusade ended. So that would be like um, 012 M42. Approximately. And that was that was there uh, and then the Plague Wars happened I think after that. Um, although actually when's the Battle of Malak, the Arcs of Omen campaign, has that got a date? I know, it's just early M42, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, Game Structure doesn't like actually putting dates out these days. No, I know why. I get why. Because people like us come along and become really annoying about it. <laughs> I get it. It's just annoying. Yeah. Just any dates. Like, dates are important. I mean, remember they actually introduced the whole concept of the Chrono Strife just to get around it. It's like, oh, we don't know what day it is because no one knows. So there's a whole war being fought about it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, actually, so I'm long actually, short of it is we don't know. <laughs> I'm actually having a look now as to who actually survived from the eight because I'm on the Arcs of Omen page because uh, I was just looking stuff up. Uh, so Bright Sword's dead, but that doesn't matter. Um. Oblotai is dead. Nasdrek's dead. Uh, Bravestorm was badly injured. Oh, Alva came to shout at him. I didn't realise that. <laughs> Actually, a, a drone of um, Al- projecting Alva came to shout at Farsight, saying that the entire Enclaves would be dead. I hope you do a lot of damage before you die. Charming. Charming. And fast I got and fast I got stoned, I was like, right, well fuck you, then you're gonna be in the new codex. <laughs> well he did kill the drone, so yeah. <laughs> hey, that's the reason why Alphar's not in the codex. Alphar killed his drone. Ah. And given the time, I think we should call it there, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you very much for tuning in this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, this has been Rem Lives from 40k Theories. And this has been Neve from Tactica Imperialis. And we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.